world in a flux, India's challenges. The session will be chaired by Air Vice Marshal Anil Gulani, Additional Director General Caps. The speakers of the session are Air Marshal Anil Khosla and Mr. Rishika Pankaj. May I request all the panelists to take their seat on the stage, please. Air Vice Marshal Anil Gulani is a qualified flying instructor and an instrument rating instructor and examiner commissioned into the fly a fighter stream of the IAF. He has commanded an Air Defense Direction Center and an operational base, and he has served at uh, several senior ranks. He is presently working as Additional Director General, Center for Air Power Studies, New Delhi. So over to you. Thank you, uh, Rishika. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to, you know, be, be seated amidst two very uh, prominent uh, personnel uh, who are going to be talking to us on our, uh, in the next session of the seminar. Air Marshal Anil Khosla retired as the Vice Chief uh, of the Indian Air Force and uh, I also have the privilege of being from the same fleet, that is the Jaguar fleet. Uh, he's uh, been a professional who's, I think, holds the singular distinction of, uh, you know, topping every course that he's attended. And uh, I don't think anybody else we've seen in the Air Force doing that. Uh, he's, uh, apart from handling the Doklam crisis uh, when he was CNC in uh, Eastern Air Command, he was also at the helm when the as the vice chief and the Wallaport operations took place uh, and uh, he's actively pursuing writing, speaking and which is uh, true to being a soldier scholar uh, post his retirement as well and giving talks. Apart from professional interests, he's also an avid uh, golfer, snooker, billiards player and uh, little unknown fact that he's a national level uh, Sudoku player uh, as well. And uh, on my left is uh, Erishka, who is uh, the director of this organization, Organization for Research on China and Asia. I happened to come across her, I think about a year ago or less than that, more than around that time. When she came and I I been reading what she has been writing, she is doing a lot of research on what is happening inside China, elite party politics. And uh, like we all know that what happens in relations between countries, a lot is governed by what is going on within the country itself. And I think that plays a very important role on how China sees the uh, world and how its relations are going to impact India, especially just after this 20th uh, party congress. As far as the uh, Russia, uh, you know, Ukraine conflict is concerned, uh, we do tend to focus on the military aspects of the conflict as to why, who's winning the war and who's not winning the war. But I think the roots of this conflict are much more deep-rooted, which go back many years. And there are other players who are not interested in this conflict coming to an end. And that is why probably it is dragging on in this uh, winter itself. So I will not take much time, uh, you know, and uh, since we have a distinguished panel over here, I'd request uh, if you have about 20, 20 to 25 minutes, and I'll ring the bell. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the kind words. And I think uh, thanks to Director of the Center of Air Power Studies uh, for inviting me and giving me this chance to share the few thoughts about the very important topic. I think uh, in the lighter vein, uh, my name has got something to do with it. Air Marshal Anil Chopra and Air Marshal Anil Golani are invited Air Marshal Anil Khosla. <laughs> so, uh, I feel privileged to be part of this seminar because uh, uh, all the uh, legacy of uh, uh, Subroto Mukherjee's six decades, my uh, interaction was actually when he passed away, I was just two years old. But at DG Air Ops, uh, I was involved in the return of his medals and uh, uniform memorabilia. And uh, as BCS, I used to draw a lot of inspiration from it because it was displayed right outside the vice chief's office. And every day I used to see it going up and down and inspire, it used to inspire a lot. Uh, the seminar 
the topic is very very relevant and it's already been covered in the first session the director did a very good global scan but uh, i'll just like to mention that the race for superpower is on between china and usa the bipolar world is slowly slowly trying to emerge but multipolar uh, polar world is also coming up power centers are grooming uh, coming up uh, the next aspect is maybe the west has ruled the roost for quite long and maybe century of asia is coming up now so in these events i mean two events which have shaken up the world in the last uh, year and a half is basically two that is the pandemic covid pandemic rising in china and the second is the ukraine conflict and uh, the ukraine conflict has thrown up a lot of issues related to new world order multilateralism collective security nuclear issues energy security economic sanctions economic warfare info warfare food and energy security so it's a very very relevant tap topic and a lot of uh, uh, it's 10 month old war where a lot has been written a lot of lessons have been derived so i have been asked to cover the lessons what i'll do is i'll give a little bit of perspective about the war which is relevant and thereafter just tag few of the lessons under the headings of general lessons related to security being a military man lessons related to war and warfare and being loyal to the air force maybe some lessons related to the air power uh, i'll just tag these issues because a learned audience like this uh, everyone knows a lot of has been written about it okay coming to the perspective of the war you know uh, rightly said in the second session that although the war is between russia and ukraine but on the broader side it is the east versus west uh, uh, war where the nato and the us led west is against the uh, us and supported by uh, its allies as far as legitimacy legitimacy and the narrative goes very very straight forward russia the narrative is that post cold war there is no need of nato but instead of winding down nato nato is expanding you are coming to my next next to my door and putting weapons there you crossed a red line i have been forced to do this action okay so i have been crying horse you have not listened to me now a stage has come where i cannot sit idle i have to do you have been pushed me against the wall and i have my got a legitimate reason to do what i have done the west is straight forward russia is expansionist is trying to get its lost glory back it's the aggressor ukraine is the poor sufferer the victim and weak need support and we are supporting him so that is what it is a uh, legitimacy of immediate action by russia is that okay these two dpr and the lpr the donbas region and all are being suppressed by ukraine and they need our help they have asked for the help and we are helping them okay as far as uh, objectives are concerned you know russia uh, gave its objectives that and first of all it declared that is a special military operation and not a war or not a uh, nothing to do with the war it is not a full fledged war and they gave the objectives are demilitarization denazification and ensuring neutral status of all the ukraine that was the stated this thing uh, maybe one of their objectives was consolidating crimea which they had annexed earlier uh let's see what have they achieved so far 10 months have gone past a lot of has been written a lot has been criticized criticism has been done so in my mind what they achieved is they achieved a corridor in west of russia that is they created a corridor in the dpr and the lpr region secondly they have consolidated crimea you know they have uh, uh, improved the access to the crimean uh, region they have ensured the water supply and the power supply by can uh, taking over the control over these issues so connectivity they have improved they have attacked all the military installations of ukraine and selectively targeted the military industry so they have pushed them back few years they had consolidated and cut off the access to black sea of ukraine but later on realizing that it will be difficult for them they have not gone to odessa they have given back kherson and also the island which they taken up so they have achieved quite a few of their objectives as far as ukraine is concerned you know they have denied a walkover which everyone thought will be a easy walkover they have denied them a easy regime change held on comparatively well and retaliated in few areas 
Okay, the commencement of the operations were very classic. This is important for military uh, uh, men, and it was going to happen in future also that it will start with strategic coercion, signaling, and deception in all the domains of warfare. Thereafter, it will be non-kinetic warfare that is creating chaos in the country by in all the cyber, space, information, electronic domain. And in this situation of chaos, the initiation will be by long-range vectors, which I call non-contact warfare, adding to the chaos, adding to the destruction. And in that, thereafter, it will be followed by contact warfare application of all your forces. And that is what exactly happened in this case also. Uh, Russia carried out a three-pronged attack, one from the north, maybe going for the juggler, maybe wanting a quick solution, having a regime change and installing a pro-Russia regime, which didn't happen. Then westwards, coming from the west, creating a corridor in the DPR and LPR region and in the south, consolidating Crimea and going towards Kherson and maybe Odisha. So three-pronged attack. Whether the going for the juggler worked or not, or whether it was a diversionary tactics, some of the analysts say maybe it was a diversionary tactics. Years later, we'll come to know the truth. Uh, I have a theory. You know, the Russian attempt of going for the juggler was, there was one factor which turned the tunnel, a very small factor, that is shouldered fired weapons. Why I say that is, you know, if you remember, a lot of criticism came that Russian convoys are totally unguarded and open to the, this thing. No, Russia has been a world power. They will not leave their military like that. They had gained the initial advantage. They had put down the Ukrainian military and they knew that the air interference will be low, but for a limited time. And in this process, link up was supposed to be by an air bridge. They took over the airfield near Kiev. They tried to make an air bridge and only thing that came in their way was proliferation of shouldered fire missile, a small weapon. And the cost of these air bridging became prohibitively high and they had to abandon it. If they had been able to form that air bridge, maybe the history would have been different. Okay, uh, they reorganized, they concentrated on the west as in south. And uh, now next phase came, it became a long drawn affair. I call it urban guerrilla warfare. That phase came where Russia started surrounding cities and Ukraine started using the hit and run tactics. Thereafter, as expected, referendum, as far as Russia is concerned, they say we have done a referendum, this is our territory. And as far as, in other words, saying that, okay, we are finished, now it's up to you, what you want to do. And now the phase has come where it is low intensity, you know, you call it revolt, insurgency, periodic attacks, skirmishes, all those things will continue. President is in, Zelensky is in US, and now it will come out whether new fresh fuel will be added to the fire, or whether the fire will be doused, or whether it will continue at a low key. So that will be clearer in the time to come. Few aspects as related to perspective is economic warfare and trade and economic warfare has come out in the big way. Challenge to petrol dollar has again cropped up. Energy being used as a weapon has again come out, and we have done well so far, you know, getting our energy needs, but we need to relook into it. And also, attack on energy sources also is being uh, a cause of concern as far as future is concerned. The nuclear card, I will not spend too much of time, I know the nuclear experts are sitting here, but in this case, uh, Russia has not only done saber rattling, it's taken out the saber, shined it, swung it around put all its forces in alert, we need to look into this as we have two nuclear armed neighbors which are not very friendly, I would say they are inimical to us. Truth is the first casualty in any war and in this case also the same thing happened. The narrative or the info warfare was dominated by the West, various reasons because of that. I don't think Russia wanted to use too much of force and the first, same reason they didn't want to publicize too much of its uh, this thing because in the long run it would have been detrimental to their cause. Russia is intriguing why is not using its full power. You know, as far as air power is concerned, if you see, they are second in the world and Ukraine stands as 27th. If you see ground forces, they are six to eight times more powerful. So why, why haven't they used the full power? So that is another intriguing question. Maybe they are keeping the major power for the big enemy. Okay, as far as India is concerned, 
the three four aspects related to ukraine war one is the tight rope walk which we had to do for pressure from both the camps join the east camp or the west camp and second is the you know so far we have done well by maintaining the neutral neutrality and abstaining from various resolutions and insisting that the war is not a solution and should be ended then second is the defense contracts we have contracts with both russia as well as ukraine supply chain space s400 supply katsa that is your uh, sanctions from america luckily the sense prevailed and they didn't uh, they do various reason they didn't apply that but one at one time apprehension was there whether it will be applied or not so these are the few things which uh, uh, india had to face secondly also russian equipment performance came into review the people criticizing that russian equipment is no good and their tactics is no good their training is no good and all sort of things so that also caused a discussion we have of course 60 70% uh, russian equipment which is reducing slowly but we still have formidable uh, quite a uh, substantial amount okay coming to the second part lessons i will just tag quickly some of the security lessons first is the most important is we have been talking about it is not only because of that also because of china self reliance atmanirbharta make in india not only in military domain i feel the atmanirbharta needs to be looked into a broader sense these days anything everything can be utilized as a weapon so we need to need, need to get into different levels of atmanirbharta into for everything maybe chips maybe oil maybe energy maybe uh, uh, economy economic uh, issues second is whole of government approach it is not only the militaries uh, anymore which fight the war since anything and everything can be of the state tool craft can be used as a weapon i think we need to have synergy between all the government agencies to deal with the situations i will not go into detail because everything is known about these things third i will tag is already in the second sen uh, session we talked about diplomatic uh, efforts as far as war is concerned diplomacy and military efforts have to be hand in glove to be effective on their own individually none will work so first is you know i'm talking about collective security and multilateralism so uh, one is very clear that nobody is going to come and fight for you you have to fight your own war and we have two enemies so we have to be ready for that having said that still we need to have interoperability with few friendly countries due to various reason one of the main reason is in gray zone operations that is no war no peace situations there are whole lot of activities which can be useful sharing of information sharing of end in cyber warfare space warfare where it can come in use so we need to increase our interoperability with friendly uh, countries as far as diplomacy is concerned various forums we talked about the trend is towards many lateralism as well as uh, you know issue based engagements i think we are so far doing well and we should continue in those okay next is related to energy security uh, we have seen that uh, you know energy surplus russia is using arm twisting tactics to uh, for its cause whereas the people who are reliant on these energy uh, imports are finding it difficult and especially when the winters coming so we need to look into holistically our sources of energy number one have multiple sources second storage you know adequate storage so that we can tide over uh, a few months at least of uh, drying up the tap third is alternate renewable energy sources so we need to look at, look at it holistically nuclear deterrence two aspects one is generally it is considered that the nuclear deterrence the nuclear weapons work as a deterrent only in the nuclear domain i think ukraine war has shown that maybe it also works in the conventional domain second issue is nuclear arms race now imagine ukraine was a nuclear power at one time 21 years back had nuclear uh, nuclear weapons been retained in ukraine russia wouldn't have thought at least five times before doing what is done so that might create nations who are close to the nuclear power to go full bore on to acquiring the nuclear this thing out of area contingency is the next we have diaspora all over the world when any, any crisis takes place whether man made or natural we have seen that so far we have done well in uh, getting them out and helping them out in this case even pakistanis use the indian name to get out of ukraine so we need to have these out of area contingencies reviewed periodically to see to cater for the changes so that when the necessity arises 
we are proactive and able to come. Sanctions do not deter aggression, which is a strength five lesson which has come out of this. However, the long term effect of sanctions need to be catered for if you are going in for any skirmish war conflict. Okay, deterrence value coming to the security lessons is the deterrence value that is the capa capa capability and capacity to wage war needs to be high. If you are powerful, nobody will touch you, but if your deterrence value goes down, people will uh, encroach upon your step on your toes. Okay, technology harnessing is a big lesson. We need to harness technology into our defense forces and in parallel, not that we use the technology for civil uses first and then come on to military, it needs to be done in parallel. Military civil fusion is very important. We need to take lesson from China, where under six verticals, industry, infrastructure, skill, technology, equipment and mobilization, in a very, very scientific controlled way, they are doing this military civil fusion. Uh, we have dual use uh, technologies, infrastructure and all, but we need to have a structured approach towards this military civil fusion. Coming to few lessons related to warfare, uh, one is the commencement I've already covered, the pattern is very, very straightforward. We need to look into dispersion of our assets so that, you know, we can cause, we can provide more number of targets to the enemy, that is, we save our assets by dispersion. We need to go underground, we need to look into safety, we need to look into infrastructure which can withstand the enemy capability. Now with hypersonics coming in, even underground is not very safe, we need to go deeper underground. Okay, uh, human factor is very, very important, it has come out in this Ukraine war, that is I'm talking about training, tactics, motivation, morale, experience, leadership, very, very important. So far we have been doing well, especially with our immediate enemies, we need to maintain this advantage. The question of Agni Veers coming in, create a little bit of doubt on these factors. The second is op agility and delegation, you know, empowering your uh, commanders in the field. I think that is another lesson which came out in the uh, Russian approach in this case. Okay. Uh, the few lessons which have been reinforced, which are known as the clearly defined aims and objectives in a war. Info warfare, the psychological effects is very, very important. The joint operations is very, very important. And theaterization is the, not the only way of achieving jointness. We have systems in place, we need to empower them. We need to do joint training, we need to do joint planning, we need to do joint exercises, we need to execute jointly, we need to review jointly. That is where this thing, and jointly we need to look into the future uh, threats uh, and China's example of forming joint strategic support force where they put all the four domains of cyber, space, electronics and info in one and made a service out of it is what is future to come, what future we'll be facing. We need to, whatever reorganization we are doing, we need to look into this, this is what we'll be facing in future. ISR is very, very important. We need to invest in space-based operation, uh, space-based surveillance that is the eyes in the sky. Supply chain management came into review, very, very important. Okay, last one minute chair, I'll talk about specific lessons related to air power, few of them. One, it has come out strength five is unrestricted use of air power is essential for it to take effect. Had Russia continued to maintain its air power or the dominance or the shaping of the battlefield, the story would have been different. Due to whatever reasons, it didn't and it has lingered on for so long. Uh, we have our own example of Kargil where we fought with the hand tied behind the back and in case you do that, then the cost goes up. Cost in terms of time, time to achieve objective, time to manpower losses and cost in terms of money. So all these three factors, so the air power has to be utilized with a free hand. Second is integration of offensive and defensive there is no segregation. Even though offen defensive has become offensive, the concept has become offensive defense. So this thought of AD command, I don't know where is it cropped up from. It's a no-go, absolutely. These two operations go hand in hand. The efficacy of no-fly zone, it's a strategic tool available, but you should have the capability to implement it. It's not you just declare it. You have to have the capability to implement that. 
Next is the importance of precision and standoff capability. We need to enhance that in terms of capacity. That means we have the capability, but we need to have more numbers, which has come out strength five. And in gray zone sort of warfare and for punitive actions, precision and standoff is very, very essential. The efficacy of and helibone operations is in question because of, as I covered earlier, because of the uh, pro proliferation of you know small arms and the shoulder fired missiles and weapons. So we need to, it's a good concept, we should not throw it out of the window, but we need to work in peace time to have a multi-directional approach, multi-DZ approach, and we need to prepare these sort of folders. There is no time in during the war or during the conflict to sit down and do such detailed planning. So it's like a target folder, we need to work in the peace time and prepare for these. Protection of own asserts, I've already said, in terms of dispersion, in terms of underground, and for re reinforcement. Uh, and most important is, Air Force is not a supporting service, as thought by few people. It is very, very important to shape the battlefield, and it is very, very important for the warfare, not only over the land, as well as sea. Drones are the future of the warfare. The drones experts are sitting here, we tell you, Drone, we use it in a very, very generic term from quadcopters to the heavy armed drones. Everything unmanned platform, we call it a drone. It's a subject in itself, but that is the future of warfare. In the end, I would say the bottom line, as we covered in the second session also, was in the world, emerging world order and the international engagement, it is all about economic growth and control of resources. Number one. Number two, the power or the deterrence value comes from a combination of economic and military strength and not one only. As an afterthought, in the Ukraine conflict, who's smiling? The max is two. One is China and second is the US arms industry. Thank you very much for the patient here. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Air Marshal Khosla. I think that was uh, very candid, educative, and I think what uh, uh, we need to keep in mind is that we must not derive wrong lessons from this conflict where the jury is out and this war probably is conflict military operation, limited military operation is going to continue for some more time and uh, reams are going to be written and discussed and you know the whole world is wondering as to what is there in Putin's mind. Russia being a military power and an economic power is still not able to achieve what it wanted to achieve or whether they underestimated the support that uh, the West would provide to Ukraine. I think uh, we will continue discussing this and we look forward to some uh, questions also on this talk. Uh, with this, we switch over to uh, China and uh, the uh, implications of the last uh, 20th CPC and uh, the implications for India uh, after this uh, Xi Jinping's third term in uh, power. Over to you, Um, I think I had a uh, Rishika, can you right. just have to, yeah. Oh. Good afternoon, everyone. It's truly an honor for me to be here on the stage today. I would like to thank CAPS for the invitation and also congratulate them on successfully hosting the 19th edition of the Subhuto Mukherjee Seminar. My talk today will focus on the 20th Party Congress of the Communist Party of China and the implications that holds for India. Xi's report to the 20th Party Congress at the opening ceremony was telling in more ways than one about the regards his, with regards to the implications his third term will hold for the world. This coupled with the new leadership he has installed bore long-term challenges in the economic, military and diplomatic domain for India. So, How do these domestic personal changes affect India and what should Delhi look out for? As the historic 20th Party Congress was coming to an end, it was extremely clear to China watchers in and around the world that we need to take a look at how the prince and all his men are going to tackle the upcoming internal and external challenges that China is set to face. Predicting these changes uh, that would take place in the Politburo, the Standing Committee and the Central Military Commission itself was crucial to the formulation of understanding vis-a-vis -vis Xi Jinping's long game. The membership and composition of these leadership bodies is certain to condition the policy implementation and ideological as well as political correctness of the party. Most importantly, the new PBSC and BB ensure Xi's vision for China remain the singular guiding principle at least for the next five years. 
The results of the 20th Party Congress, particularly the makeup of the important leadership bodies, have determined how much influence and control Xi Jinping will continue to hold over the next five years. At the recently concluded Party Congress, 376 members, of which 205 were full members, 107 alterna 171 alternate members, were elected for the new Central Committee from 2,296 total delegates. Seven members of the Central Military Commission are also from the new Central Committee. Amongst the CC members, 24 were appointed to the Politburo of the CPC. Seven out of these 24 were appointed to the Politburo Standing Committee. Now, whether you are a China watcher or not, this seven-member seven member body is critical to understanding any and all actions China and Beijing are going to impose bilaterally, regionally, and internationally over the next seven years, over the next five years, if not more. I would like to focus the, my talk today into three sub-themes, military, economics, and diplomacy. I'll be connecting each of these with the CMC, PBSC, and the PB. To begin with, what are the implications of the new CMC, which is the Central Military Commission for India? Historically, CMC has always been an all-men body, which, is a, which was a tradition that was also continued in the 20th CMC. Xi Jinping has continued as the chairman of, for, of the CMC for the third consecutive term. Apart from him, there are only two members from the previous CMC, which are Chang, Yusha, and Miao Hua, that have retained their membership in the CMC. Chang, importantly, is 72 years old and will continue as the vice chairman of the CMC even though that breaks age restrictions. Another vice chairman is He Widong, and he has been brought into the CMC despite not being a central committee member in the last term. All CMC members are full members of the CC and hold key positions in China's military apparatus. Except Liu Shanli, all other members in the CMC belong to the 1950s generation, which indicates the importance of seniority and experience for appointment in the CMC. Post the 17th National Party Congress, there was a bifurcation that was easily visible between the military and the party in China. Herein, we began to see the identity of the military move beyond that of the CPC. It is always referred to as the party's army rather than China's and become more inclined towards individual leadership patterns. The reform of the military has centrally been shaped around Xi Jinping's thought. His emphasis now rests on the centennial goal of having a world-class military by 2027 for the People's Liberation Army. Excerpts from Xi Jinping's speech at the 20th Embassy, beyond highlighting the successes of the 19th Embassy, NPC have shown focus on military building, throwing light on continued modernization processes in China. Integrated development of the military through mechanization, information, and application of smart technologies is going to take key focus in Xi Jinping's CMC planning for the next five years. Herein, indenization of arms and equipment, as well as enhancing its role as a defense exporter, are factors India must prepare for. Importantly, such export of its defense market can be expected to cater to Africa-China military ties which will further strengthen China's political clout in a continent where India has long been attempting, attempting to bring stronger cross-continental ties. She has sought to encourage more people to serve in the PLA, the focus on reform of military universities and colleges, better honor and incentivization services in the defense forces, as well as the making of more public national defense subgroups at the regional level, shows that there is going to be focus on active military personnel inclusion. India already lags behind China on this front, and this incentivization drive is something that could tilt the fighting favor more in favor of China, at least vis-a-vis -vis land forces, active land forces concerned. Moreover, the, the goal to modernize military theory in a bid to build in a bid to enhance the military's strategic capabilities for defending China's sovereignty, these are direct quotes from Xi's speech, indicate Xi's continued focus on not just Taiwan, but also the line of actual control, especially as Xi has spoken repeatedly throughout the course of his opening and closing speech of winning local wars. The promotion and remo removal of Chinese generals will remain completely Xi Jinping controlled. Since becoming chairman of the CMC, she has overseen the promotion of over 60 full generals. This is an unprecedented record in Chinese military history. 
Recent trends post-2020 have witnessed a preference for LAC-focused military officials along the lines of those specializing on Taiwan, receiving operational capabilities in both theaters of the Western and Eastern Theater Command, gaining promotions. As the system of ultimate responsibility continues to rest with CMC chairman, the focus on combating corruption in the military, we've all read about the Xi Jinping's anti-corruption drive that he has implemented in and across China in a bid to remove rival, you know, rival faction, rival, rival uh, politicians. The inclusion of the CCDI into the military, CCDI is China's Discipline Inspection Committee, there has been talks now that have been emerging of building a CCDI organ within that of the CMC. Herein, we are going to see a strong CMC CCDI drive wherein not just promotion of generals, there's also going to be direct, direct focus from the cadre level up by Xi Jinping in removing people that he believes do not fall, adhere to his policy line rather than just that of the, of the, of the country. The new CMC has, in this case, been termed a war council on Taiwan by a lot of US strategists. That is a deduction that, to me, is, seems more misplaced, if not unidimensional. If anything, the new CMC has a strong India connection. Firstly, the appointment of He Weidong, who has been a former commander of PLA Western Theatre Command and was also Deputy Party Secretary of PLA Ground Force during Doklam, as Vice Chair replacing retiring uh, Chu Chiliang shows she's seriousness vis-a-vis -vis the LAC. He Weidong's new position is a double promotion and breaks convention as he has never served in the Central Committee or the CMC before. Importantly, amidst a spate of personnel changes that were appointed commander in the WTC post Galwan, Her Weidong appears to have performed well, as his next appointment was to the Eastern Theatre Command as commander. Furthermore, his move to the ETC was essentially a swap with then ETC Force Commander Chu Chiliang, who took over the WTC in place of her. Importantly, Chu Chiliang is a newcomer to the Central Committee in the capacity of a full committee member, showing that he too performed in the WTC, resuming and uh, resulting in a promotion. Li Fengbao, who is currently the political commissar of the WTC, is another military leader with a strong India focus that has been retained in the Central Committee. Li has previously held the position of commander of the strategic support force that deals with information and cyber warfare, especially along China's border regions. The remaining four CMC members are also key Xi loyalists. Only Liu Shanli and Zhang Yu, Zhang Yusha have combat experience in the new 20th CMC while four members are from the army, showing emphasis on land-based policies. Nevertheless, the appointment of two vice chairs with direct India-dealing experience and the presence of technocrat Li Shangfu in the CMC, who is poised to be the next defense minister of China, makes it clear that the implications of the military reshuffle on the LAC and Indian national security are said to be wide-ranging. Importantly, as a technocrat, Li Shangpu can be expected to push for Chinese defense ties with partners to take on a stronger technology ambit. Herein, for India, a stronger push from China in exporting defense technology to states like Pakistan, North Korea, and even Russia, both security and economic concerns. Moving beyond the CMC, what are the economic implications of the new MPC for India? China's gross domestic product has only improved by 3.9% in the July-September quarter. The data has surpassed 3.4 prediction rate, otherwise uh, gaining momentum from the 0.4% increment. Nonetheless, Beijing's economic growth has been impeded by the persistence of COVID-19 restrictions, an escalating real, real estate crisis, and the worldwide economic downturn. We've seen a lot of protests in the past year erupt in and around China. Uh, focusing not just on the Hanan bank crisis, but also on the zero COVID implications and the restrictions that are being posed. Export growth has reduced to 5.7%, making it a first such decline in over two years, spearheaded by a weakening demand and impact of COVID protocols. Now, in the new NPC, the absence of career economists like Li Keqiang, Liu He, Wang Yang, Yi Gang, and Gu Shongko from the new team will certainly be felt by Qi. Even as economic reform and zero COVID continue to implement, uh, albeit struggling for balance, the direction of Li Keqiang's economic model will stay another year or two. 
New members will be more focused on demonstrating their commitment to Xi, which indicates a continuity of older policies and that are not, especially as the new team are not economists. Focus on common prosperity, especially dual circulation strategy, is vital to predict implications for India. The cementing of common prosperity as the core economic agenda has seen the constitutionalization of dual circulation in the 20th Party Congress. This self-reliance focus of Chinese economy via dual circulation can provide opportunities for India. China's decision to concentrate on more advanced industrial production could speed up the country's withdrawal from labor-intensive manufacturing sectors, something India can and should take advantage of. India has until now lagged behind in attracting these businesses, but there's still time to benefit from it. Over the next 10 years, we can expect two key, under, two key concurrent shifts in the global uh, geoeconomics, deglobalization and transfer of supply chains away from China. Here, the latter will increase while the former will decrease Indian export markets. Furthermore, as India works with Japan and Australia to build the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative to create a non-China dependent sustainable supply chain network, the renewed focus on dual circulation in China can be utilized yet again to Delhi's benefit. In order to minimize China's economic reliance on fixed asset investment, which has dem demonstrated dwindling returns in China, dual circulation also em emphasizes the importance of private consumption and services. As per the third quarter report, nonetheless, fixed asset investment has only increased by 5%, which can spearhead a significant shift in economic goals within China. In terms of economic policies, it is also clear that zero COVID is here to stay and will continue to hamper economic recovery. Members of the new economic team will continue to demonstrate uh, a, a extension of Li Keqiang's zero COVID policies, which means that there's going to be less and less opening of market reforms. Importantly, the new PBSC has brought in significant diplomatic posturing changes vis-a-vis -vis China India ties. The retirement of top diplomat Yang Jishi has set the stage for a new foreign ministry helmsman. Herein, the inclusion of Foreign Minister Wang Yi, who is 69 years old and well above the retirement age, to the Politburo indicates him as the potential replacement. It also shows that age norms for respecting retirement are a thing of the past as long as Xi's policy line is to be met. Nationalist uh, Chinese and foreign media have long termed uh, Wang Yi a, one of China's oldest and most prominent wolf warriors. Owing to his years of service as foreign minister, Wang's repertoire has made him adept in dealing with the international challenges that China has faced over the past 10 years. Inclusion of other hardline diplomats like King Gang, who is currently uh, ambassador to the US, shows a continuity in wolf warrior diplomacy. This month, uh, towards the end of November actually, we've seen uh, Sun Weidong, who is currently China's ambassador to India, be promoted to a vice ministerial position in China. This again highlights a very strong India-focused undercurrent that Xi Jinping is implementing in his cabinet reshuffle. China's mounting international pressures ranging from rivalry with the US to strained bilateral ties with India, South Korea, Japan, Australia show that the retention of Wang Yi, despite him reaching retirement age, is to ensure experienced leadership that can definitely sway public opinion. In the United Nations, China's leadership of the Coffee Club continues to limit advances of G4 countries towards permanent membership of the Security Council. This is the trend that is likely to remain. Concurrently, the recent refusal of China yet again to blacklist Pakistani-based terrorists has again reignited Beijing's closeness to Iron Brother Pakistan and rejection of India's national security interests on international platforms. Unlike Yang Jiuqi, who maintained a lower international profile once he reached uh, the position of foreign ministry head, Wang Yi can be expected to detain his international presence, especially as he has become one of the most recognized and uh, recognized faces of Chinese politics internationally. His core understanding of maneuvering tensions with rival powers is, indicates his continued presence of interna on the international stage. For India, presence of both Wang Yi and potential new foreign minister King Gang will mean a continued push by China on unilateral attempts at justifying LAC changes limiting India's role in the United Nations, opposition to Delhi's membership bid for nuclear suppliers group, attempts at tilting allegiances at multilateral forums like the SCO 
and the Russia, India, China trilateral, as well as statements interfering in India's internal security matters, such as those on Kashmir. Approval of conference visas for think tanks or, or academic engagements will continue to remain minimal, owing to the tense bilateral and COVID-19 restrictions. Furthermore, as Chinese citizens remain barred from international travel, a gap will quickly begin to emerge in multi-track diplomacy as engagements between academicians, policy makers, and businessmen stay limited, if not non-existent. What does Xi's new Politburo and PBSC denote vis-a-vis -vis China's domestic politics and Xi Jinping's own power? The unsurprising continuation of Xi Jinping marked with a further consolidation of his power vis-a-vis -vis constitutional amendments to the party constitution has brought with it some surprising changes. For instance, beyond Li Chanshu and Hang Zheng, members of the PBSC that were above retirement age, the surprising retirement of Wang Yang, who was 65 and could have stayed another term, shows that Xi's next term is going to be dedicated towards bringing in younger blood into the core leadership. However, there is no successful appoint successor appointment that seems imminent. In such a situation, it is not improbable to imagine a fourth term for, the, for Xi Jinping, if possible, as per his health allows. Li Keqiang's retirement, which was largely expected, has set the stage for an almost complete expulsion of youth league faction from core party echelons. Especially as the demotion and rank of prediction favorite Hu Chunwa uh, dealt a major blow to the faction's power. Beyond Hu, those who have remained uh, have signaled their political lineage, forcing them further away from the youth league faction. Similarly, removal of Go Shangkun and Hang Zhen, members of the Shanghai faction led by Jiang Zemin, have also been removed. Ultimately, this has further shown that there is now almost, almost a complete expulsion of pa factional politics in the CPC, making CPC a one-party strong, uh, a one-faction strong party. Such domestic political maneuvering highlights that building and maintaining public opinion and policy implementation will now increasingly be directly and only directly from Xi Jinping, with little to no opposition even behind closed doors, such as in meetings of Bidaiha. In such an instance, the continued implementation of zero COVID policy, which has greatly shaped the entry and continued stay of foreign nationals and students, including a lot of those from India and China, Media reportage of international events and local news, as well as influence operations targeting rival powers such as India and the US, will be implemented by key Xi loyalists. These include new international liaison department head Liu Chiangchao and new propaganda chief Li Shuli, who has been promoted to the now 24-member strong Politburo. For India, these leadership changes set the stage for a stronger push on hybrid warfare by China, the documentary shown at the 20th Party Congress itself had scenes from the Galwan clash. Previously, Chinese soldiers from the June 2020 clash were honored at the Winter Olympics. These actions show a continued nationalistic fervor to ensure party support. To Indian China analysts, beyond these implications for Delhi itself, what has the 20th NPC leadership shuffle shown about internal China? A striking feature of the 20th Politburo is the absence of female representation. Uh, Sun Chunlan, China's vice premier and the only female member of the 19th Politburo, was retired at the 20th Congress. Surprisingly, none of the 11 eligible females from the Central Committee replaced her, making the Politburo an all-men bod all body for the first time since 1977. This has hollowed out Xi Jinping's claim of promoting gender equality in China, which was made in the work report delivered at the 20th Party Congress itself. Technocrats have also formed an integral part of Xi's new team, as 7 out of 24 Politburo members have an education in STEM fields. Even though it is similar to technocratic representation in the 19th Politburo, it signifies that Xi believes in technical expertise to carry out China's policies aimed at achieving self-reliance. Two of these technocrats, uh, Ma Xingru and Yuan Jinchong, have aerospace ex expertise, whereas Li Ganshi and Chang Jining are environment and experts. Other technocrats come from health, manufacturing, and trade sectors, implying Xi's priority areas in the coming years. There has been, as per the new PBSC, selective application of 
age limit customs. Only two members of the previous PSC have been retained in their seats. This shows that the Xi, Gang, the Xi, Jinping, Xi Jinping faction, also called the Xi Gang, can remain centrally placed in all key positions, not just for the next five years, but the next 10 years, owing to one, party, one faction strong party politics in China. Such domestic political maneuvering highlights that building and maintaining public opinion and policy implementation will also now more and more emerge directly from Xi. Another interesting trend observed in the Politburo is that 11 out of 24 members have previously served as provincial party secretaries. Most of these provinces are located in eastern China, which indicates Xi's preference for administrators from well-developed coastal regions. Very few coastal provinces from these, uh, such as Chongqing and, Xinj and Xinjiang, have re been represented in the Politburo. These appointments underline the importance of provincial party secretaries in Chinese politics as a channel for political mobility. The trend is important to study for China analysts in and, around, in and outside India to understand how Xi's long-term policy planning is going to take place. PSC appointments of Li Xi and uh, Sai Xi have surprised analysts who expected Xi Jinping to maintain some degree of collective leadership by promoting Hu Chunhua or Chan Guanggu, who were from opposing factions. Li Xi has been promoted to the PSC and appointed head of the CCDI and has strong ties with Xi Jinping. Similarly, Sai Xi also holds strong personal relationships with Xi Jinping and owes his political rise directly to China's supreme leader. He has worked under Xi for four, 15 years in Fujian and five years in Zhejiang, earning him four promotions in the last five years. The size of the 20th Politburo has been uh, the, sorry, the size of the 20th Politburo has been reduced from 25 to 24 members for the first time. Based on the age restriction of 68, it was expected that 11 Politburo members would be retiring from the 19th Politburo. Ten of these members retired with the exception of Chang Yusha. However, four other members were removed from the Politburo despite not reaching that age limit. This shows that Xi's efforts to signal loyalty, that this shows that efforts by Chinese politicians to signal Biao Tai or political loyalty to Xi Jinping no longer hold the same value as they once did. Overall, Xi's new leadership underlines the importance of having a personal or professional relationship with Xi Jinping in the past. It signifies chance, it significantly enhances prospects for promotion and assures the top leader of loyalty, reliability, and competence. Although Xi Jinping runs the risk of surrounding himself with yes-men, the new leadership also confirms Xi's complete control of the party and the diminished influence of rival factions, which no longer enjoy any representation at the highest levels of the CPC. This will have far-reaching implications for China's policy-making in the coming years. In conclusion, making projections, obviously, vis-a-vis -vis Chinese party politics is difficult because the security environment uh, is in a constant geopolitical flux. A lot will actually depend on how things play out and develop on a case-by-case -case model. Nonetheless, certain appointments like that of Wang Yi, He Weidong, Chang Yusha, being unconventional vis-a-vis -vis age and the experience norms highlight a strong India undercurrent in Xi's cabinet planning. Even as strategists predict, strategists predict Taiwan, domestic economic moves, and power consolidation as main focuses for Xi, it is critical for Delhi to observe the shift in leadership posturing that China has undertaken as it shows Xi's game plan for engaging with India for the next five years. In such a situation, India must prepare for a consistency, if not an increase, in China's assertive actions vis-a-vis -vis the LAC and regional power politics. Wolf warrior diplomats at the helm of the foreign ministry will pose it continued pressure on India in international forums as well as in bilateral engagements. Yet, as the Indian diplomacy gets more and more in tune with its own nationalistic sentiment and power, as seen with Delhi's strong, a strong and steady position on Russia-Ukraine conflict despite Western pressure, it becomes well-placed to handle Chinese wolf warrior diplomacy. Furthermore, long-term engagement with Wang Yi makes his diplomatic leadership style somewhat predictable for India. Herein, focus on understanding the next new foreign minister, potentially Ching Gang, and their history with South Asia is critical. On the military domain, Delhi must begin preparing for, for, for further future skirmishes along the LAC, especially as China appoints strong India-focused generals to the CMC. 
Herein, influence operations and drone warfare both continue to be dominating security threats that will see a stronger push in the coming months. Importantly, a key area that Delhi needs to build management strategy for is the onset of the succession process of the 14th Dalai Lama. Economically, while a continuity can be expected in India's bilateral trade with China, despite attempts at reducing dependence, Delhi must actively build on the SCRI with Japan and Australia. Restructuring of supply chains to be more sustainable and less China-driven is important. Moreover, focus on Taiwan will allow India deeper synergy with the West, wherein it remains somewhat diplomatically alienated due to its stand on Russia. As she settles in with a team that is less economically inclined as before and remains more focused on continuation of policies like dual circulation, India must use the momentum to tap into manufacturing markets that have erstwhile been dominated by Beijing. The interlinking of military, economics, and domestic politics with foreign policy is a trend that is clearly visible in Xi Jinping's speeches and in his candidate selections. India must prepare on its own bilateral with China, keeping these changes in mind. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arishka. That was, I think, very comprehensive to get an inside view of, you know, what transpired in the 20th uh, CPC and how the entire reshuffle has taken place and what guides or governs uh, Xi Jinping's thought. And uh, as we can see that India remains at the center uh, as far as uh, what China intends to do to contain India. We have, I think we'll take about 15 minutes for uh, Q&A. So the house is open. Please uh, go ahead. Yeah, please, please. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I'm AVM Tejbi from NDC. Firstly, let me compliment A. Marshal Khosla for very first type pointed solutions uh, post the uh, Ukraine war. Like you rightly pointed out, sir, the two things which have really impacted the world in the last few years is COVID and the Ukraine crisis. While both of them have impacted every part of the world economically, uh, the advantage till now has been with the US and China. But with the way that things are panning out, I don't think so. This will remain forever. Russia has hit a stalemate and will continue to weaken, especially with America pulling out of the, the whole thing. Can you just crystal gaze, how do you think this whole crisis is going to end or it is going to remain a protracted war where it will go into irrelevance? My question is to Air Marshal Anil Khosla. Sir, do you feel that in future warfare, will drones be doctrine-centric or will their role be limited to force multipliers? Thank you. Uh, yeah, Nara. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, my question relates to uh, China's uh, CMC. They have two departments. Uh, one is uh, Department of Science and Technology, second is Equipment Development Department. So I would like to know how much of these departments are contributing to China's uh, military, technical and aerospace capabilities. And uh, as per the recent reports, a lot of military uh, domain technology experts have been inducted in the CPC. Uh, if you could throw a light and how does it uh, become relevant in Indian context. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, a uh, few thoughts. Firstly, uh, Tejbi's question, how is the crisis going to end? As I said, you should ask US President. <laughs> okay. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the crisis has reached a stage where it is now, as far as Russia is concerned, they said we have done the referendum, we have declared it our country. As far as I am concerned, it's over, up to you now. What do you, the ball is in your court. And this meeting which is taking place is very, very important, as I said. In my opinion, even if, uh, say, same level is maintained, 
uh, that means uh, the, it's not further escalated. The smaller skirmishes, attacks, all these things will continue. Okay, and Russia knows that and prepared for that. And what will happen is whenever these attacks take place through drones or through uh, subversion or whatever it is, the punitive action will come from Russia. And as far as diplomatic effort, you know, like Crimea is still not resolved, so th that will continue for years altogether. So, in other words, in my opinion, uh, next few weeks, we will have to wait and watch to see what exactly it pans out. But smaller skirmishes will continue. Second, second question about drone warfare, the answer is very straightforward. It will be a doctrinal influencer, not a force multiplier. Uh, every country is working on it. Even India has declared uh, in the last Aero India, the loyal wingman concept is the term which is being used. And I call it mother goose concept where you have both manned and unmanned platforms working together in synergy. And advantages of both manned platforms as well as unmanned platforms, both have got advantages and disadvantages, are harnessed. The advantages are harnessed and it multiplies the effect. So that is where we are heading for. Even people who are talking about 7th, 8th, 9th, even 10th generation platforms, they are talking about in AI enabled uh, platforms which can operate autonomously without human intervention or human intervention far away. So those things are being talked about. So in my opinion, drones are going to be a big doctrinal influencer. And when we talk about drones, it's not only the armed drones, we're talking about smaller swarm technology also where a lot of smaller platforms like ants or uh, even smaller work in unison and as a team uh, to derive whatever objective they have been on for. So drone industry is going to be a big way. While the offensive part of drones will be exploited, there is a lot of scope for anti-drone technology and in the industry. And world over, the research is going on in the anti-drone field to find measures, soft kill, hard kill, even birds are being trained to catch hold of smaller platforms. So uh, that is what I feel about the future of drones in warfare. So, um, as far as the importance of technocrats is concerned in the new NPC, um, you spoke of the Department of Science and uh, Science and Technology and the Department of Equipment Development. Both of these have taken on extremely strong hues for Xi Jinping's CMC. We are seeing that the next, uh, the, the inclusion of technocrats such as Li Shangfu in the CMC. Li Shangfu was responsible for the PLA's digitization uh, ground task force and he has specialized training in space warfare. Similarly, the inclusion of two, others, two other technocrats in the CMC that have dedicated aerospace and equipment, their engineers by profession, aer aeronautical engineers by profession, goes to show that Xi Jinping's small leading groups, he's created the system of small leading groups. There, there have been the creation of eight new small leading groups in the past year itself, focused only on aer aerospace as well as drone warfare and digitization along the LAC. I think that in the coming five years, we are going to see an increased uh, focus by the CMC, spearheaded by the CMC and Xi Jinping himself on aerospace and drone warfare, especially vis-a-vis -vis export of defense technologies. That is something that he is increasingly building Chinese you know, expertise and Chinese capabilities in. He is looking to interact the new, uh, the signing of new treaties, the signing of new defense uh, treaties with Pakistan and with North Korea are always having defense technology as an addendum, which has become increasingly common in the past three years as opposed to five years before, as opposed to the 19th CMC. Even in the 19th CMC, Politburo as a whole, the 25 member Politburo that was there in the 19th uh, NPC, there were uh, there was a larger representation of technocrats as opposed to career politicians. Similar trends have been observed this time as well, and that tendency is only likely to continue. With small leading groups focusing on aerospace warfare, on uh, drone warfare, on you know the creation of, there's been creation of three new in the past two months, there's been creation of three new aerospace and defense, national defense universities in China. They, these are sprouting up all across 
the country as as external or additional trainings for already existing uh, you know PLA cadres. So that trend is only likely to continue and was clearly visible in the speech Xi Jinping has made as well. So as far as your question is concerned on the importance of technocrats in the coming year, I think there's going to be a there's going to be a time wherein um, with the focus with the clear lean with the clear leaning towards technocracy and techno technocrats gaining more promotions, even the non-technocrat population, non-technocrat politicians and cadres of the PLA or and of the of the CPC as a whole are gaining uh, diploma courses. They are doing STEM diploma courses, and it's become it's also become it's become regional requirements for the provinces they are getting assigned to. So there's going to be increasing incorporation of technocrats, both new and for the existing ones, to gain some level of expertise in the STEM fields. So I think that is only going to grow in the coming five years. I think we can take on one or two more questions. Yeah, Niji. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, this question is for uh, Irmashin Khusla. Uh, sir, in the ongoing war, the airspace, uh, the battlefield transparency uh, was a major issue why the Russians could not, probably one of the issues why Russians could not achieve what they wanted to do. So the relevancy to us is that what happens in case, like uh, for example, any aircraft which is taking off within the space uh, of entire Russia or any missile which is taking off is being seen by the other side through the radar systems which are uh, located beyond the order, uh, beyond the uh, borders of the battles, battlefield, that is Ukraine. Uh, so what is happening is that probably the entire information of every drone, every small aircraft or missile which is incoming is already available to the uh, Ukrainian uh, defense systems. Now the relevance to us is that suppose we have on our one of our uh, borders uh, a skirmish taking place but the entire information is, is being transmitted from the other side. So do, what kind of impact do you think such an event uh, or a, a, such a problem which the Russians are facing, still they are uh, they're facing the same uh, problem. How do one plan to deal with uh, such a uh, issue? Uh, uh, keeping in mind that they, they will not want to really escalate beyond the uh, boundaries of uh, Ukraine. But at the same time, their entire, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, the impact which they have taken, uh, it has been caused due to this uh, incoming intelligence and the entire, uh, supply chain which is working towards dealing with this uh, problem. Thanks. Uh, so my question is for uh, Ms. Pankaj. Uh, you know, China's also, we've been talking about their focus towards India and uh, how they're going to, uh, you know, approach India. The question is uh, that they're also facing a lot of challenges in this entire purge of uh, uh, corruption. Uh, it's also taken on a lot of uh, technical uh, companies of China and have, uh, for example, uh, Alibaba, etc. And uh, primarily the, the analysis is that they were, he wanted to eliminate all opponents and these, uh, some of these uh, businesses were feeding his opponents and that is why he was feeling a bit of a heat uh, on that front. Now, considering the ma uh, manner in which he has uh, decelerated the tech industry and that, you know, the issues of uh, economic issues of uh, the property bubble and other uh, difficult economic situations that are coming about, uh, how much investment can China continue to do in these STEM activities? I know they still have an export surplus of, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars every year, but still that is reducing. Their challenges are mounting because they spread themselves into many, many areas. Do you think this could create some opportunities for India? Or do you think that we still, um, you know, uh, have to watch out for uh, something immediate on our borders?
Please go ahead. Last question. Thank you. Uh, Gulshan Luthra from India Strategic Magazine. Mine is, a, mine is an observation and a suggestion. We attend air shows, defense shows outside India. One of the biggest complaints of the main complaint we hear for, uh, from possible customers is that products made in India lack precision manufacturing and even aesthetics. I think here the Air Force cap should, probably you should interact with the industry and tell them whatever you make, it should be effective in firing and it must look good. Every Chinese, Chinese thing, pen to onwards, they look so good. What's wrong with us? Why can't we do that? Precision and aesthetics, that will go for you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> I think you have uh, thrown in quite a few things in that question, uh, ranging from missiles to air defense to info warfare to uh, flow of information to uh, safety from those to offensive, this thing. So, uh, I, I think we can have a discussion it over the lunch, but to keep it short, what I'd say is that uh, this problem of information being available is not nothing new. In the previous wars also, in our context, I'm talking about there have been live intelligence, human being available to the enemy as well as to us also. Uh, you take the example of Balakot strike, how we kept so, uh, we achieved tactical surprises by, you know, shadowing everything and continuing everything as normal. So that, you know, no sign is given that we are trying something and from some particular base. So it's not a new thing. It's only the question of how it is evolving over the years this flow of information or the intelligence gathering is not only related to the moment, now the domains are uh, uh, widened, whole new, of new domains of cyberspace and uh, have come in. And secondly, as far as you know, missiles are concerned, what is happening is, earlier I'm talking about the long range, absolutely long range vectors, where the trajectory was, could be forecasted. Now with the hypersonics coming in, the trajectory, they are the hypersonic weapons, the difference between uh, the, the thing is that they are using the medium of the space, but they are mobile. Mobile in the sense means their trajectory can be altered, cannot be predicted. The control is with you. So that is another aspect. You may be able to see the launch, you may be able to track the launch initially, but the trajectory you cannot forecast. So interception becomes that much difficult, number two. Number three is... Uh, as far as uh, these, uh, as I said, when you're talking about defensive against these, then obviously the in input or the intelligence of where they're originating from helps in initially. So you need to have the capability of long range radars, which we have also been working on. You know, the BMD takes a very important, uh, becomes an important factor in the air defense domain. The air defense domain is really expanded with catering for small drones to going into Ballistic Missile Defenses, BMD, sort of uh, this thing. So you need to have the capability of uh, space warfare, intercepting these weapons at a longer distance and being able to track about it. So that is another area where we need to uh, look into. So these are the few factors which I thought uh, uh, would answer your questions. <coughs> Um, so, as far as the crackdown on tech firms and not just tech firms, but the entertainment industry, the real estate industry, the banking crisis, even the social media platforms in China is concerned, that crackdown, I feel we should view more from the lens of external security threats rather than internal security. Xi Jinping's disassociation or dissatisfaction, say, with Jack Ma, <coughs> Uh, was more a result of Jack Ma's growing um, engagements with the United States. It was more an external security threat for Xi rather than an internal security threat wherein he would use the CCDI or you know the corrup corruption charges to remove Jack Ma from power. Instead, the focus is on taking these private industries and making them state-driven, state-run. <coughs> The long game there is also to include them at some point or the other in the BRI framework. Mostly all state-run enterprises in China have been associated with some BRI project or the other. Apart from the banks, even if you look at the, so the real estate crisis, 
was more connected to Evergrande, the firm Evergrande in China. Um, that is a firm that was um, asked three years back for a small um, investment to be made into the BRI. They had refrained from doing so at that time, especially because they did have some private uh, power in saying no to such a to such a request. At this juncture, whether or not um, that creates any opportunities for India, since it is more an external security driven threat that Xi Jinping is viewing vis-a-vis -vis the, the deduction of power that he wants to give these private entities and private uh, sector entrepreneurs, I would say that probably not. That is not probably where I feel India can find some leeway or build some opportunities for itself on. However, there is still a lot of there are still a lot of lessons to take from the way Xi Jinping is going about, lessons to take for India with the way Xi Jinping is going about this crackdown. There is a clear focus on isolation and, you know, with dual circulation, with the dependence, with the creation of supply chains turning inwards in China. There is emerging opportunities, opportunities for India in Southeast Asia and East Asia, you know, in countries like Cambodia, Vietnam, Philippines, there's still, there's still room where India can take advantage of the technological uh, subdivisions. I was recently, uh, I was in a meeting recently with uh, members of uh, uh, visiting delegation from Taiwan and they were speaking about the semiconductor industry being, you know, shaped more towards India. There are opportunities that are coming to the Indian government wherein they can open semiconductor plants there has been investments in Gujarat and Maharashtra that have already started. Those kind of opportunities are more what I feel India should take away from the tech crackdown happening within China instead of focusing on or instead of looking at how there is a, there is a connect between, you know, there's a connect between supply chain opportunities for India vis-a-vis -vis Alibaba or Evergrande. Those, those connects are not going to take place vis-a-vis -vis India. But the broader regional supply chains and the regional, uh, you know, labor-intensive markets, yes, there is definitely a lot of scope wherein India can, uh, you know, take advantage of the crackdown Xi Jinping is imposing on private sector uh, industries and banking uh, financial institutions. So, yeah. Yeah, Marshall Khosla, would you like to take on uh, Gulchan Lutra? Yeah, actually, uh, so your observation is very, very valid and pertinent. But there is a broader uh, issue involved in this whole thing. Uh, as you say that, you know, we are trying to be Atmanibar, and especially in defense industry. But uh, to be Atmanibar, one of the factors is you need to enter the international global market. And uh, because the clientele in India will be limited and some of the private industry is reluctant to come because of uh, not being assured uh, clientele. So now when you want to enter the international market, you need to look into a lot of things. And it's not only the defense industry or a particular DPSU or a particular private industry which needs to do all the work. It's a whole nation, whether are we ready to do it? When I say that, you know, not only the quality of the, uh, the looks of the product, that is one minor SD, but major SD we need to look into. Whether we can support that uh, equipment or platform subsequently, post-sale supports. Safety is very, very important. We have sold some platforms they have not worked, they are not working, that gives very negative publicity. Our working culture, our working ethos, are they at the international standard? Uh, whatever we are producing, uh, do we stick to the timelines, take the Rafale examples? The Frenchies have uh, delivered the aircraft, it may be one day early, but it will not be one hour late. Can we, uh, can we do that? Sir? So there are a whole lot of factors we need to look into to when we go into the international market and we need to review the whole thing holistically and take some solid action, then only we'll be able to make our foothold. And it's not easy. They are competing against already established uh, suppliers, already established worldwide uh, uh, proven uh, firms. Now to get a foothold in that, you need to compete with them. You need to come to their standards. So it's a holistic uh, view we need to look into so, and address the issues. Uh, thank you. Uh I'm asking Khosla and Arishika, I think we've had a very engaging and interesting session and uh, a lot of uh, discussion has taken place on what are the uh, challenges and opportunities for India in this present situation that 
we are being faced with. And uh, may I request you all now to please give a round of applause for both the speakers. I invite E.G. Caps to present souvenirs to the panelists. Three <laughs> we have now come to the closing session. I would request Air Marshal Anil Chopra, DG Caps, to deliver the closing remarks and vote of thanks. So you all will agree with me that we have had uh, two very, very stimulating uh, sessions, uh, two great chairs, four great speakers, and uh, covered a lot of ground. And uh, uh, I, I must say that the air chief in the morning laid the grounds uh, when he said that uh, bigger fish eats smaller fish, and uh, that everybody has to fend for themselves. And the Atamir Bharta is required. We have to build com com comprehensive national park. And uh, uh, over and above that, he mentioned specifically about the air power we need for more fighter aircraft, FRAs, and uh, AWC aircraft. But uh, he did mention the importance of partnerships, which came out throughout uh, the event in the different uh, sessions that we went through. Uh, tyranny of geography is a word. Uh, that uh, we have been hearing earlier, but uh, I think this has uh, come out very, very clearly. Uh, this is the reality. This is the reality for which uh, Pakistan gets to have an advantage uh, because of their physical location. I also like the idea of them saying that, uh, you know, instead of uh, being the Indian subcontinent, uh, they gradually started calling it South Asia. Uh, that means restricting us and our importance to a much uh, smaller uh, you know, zone and area. Yes, uh, there are constraints, uh, whether it's the Chinese, whether it's uh, somebody else, uh, uh, putting on us when it comes to BIMSTEC and connection between Ganga, Mekong. So there are issues, uh, but uh, the country has chosen to uh, take on Look East and Act East policy. Uh, certainly much more needs to be done. But like Pakistan, Myanmar is becoming a little bit of hurdle because of the Chinese influence over there. Uh, so we need to find our uh, own importance. We have to get our slot in the regional groupings. And we all saw the complication of the regional groupings, especially SCO and BRICS. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, of course, how SARC has become uh, somewhat uh, defunct, but we have to look for uh, opportunities and uh, try to make the best of it. Can India be a bridge uh, in all this? Uh, uh, you know, there are doubts uh, about it, uh, but that has uh, sort of uh, been discussed at length. Uh, as far as Ukraine is concerned, I think the last bullet is still to be fired. Uh, we in CAPS are getting speakers and uh, heads of think tanks every week. We have listened to the Russians, to the Hungarians, to the Taiwanese, to the uh, you know, the, the Brits and French, we have had somebody coming to us as recent as day before yesterday. So we are listening, and uh, clearly the Europeans are angry. They are together. This is the impression we are getting. Uh, 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 but uh, his, um, uh, who's the gainer? Certainly we all know Ukraine is a loser. 
you know, we know that the Europe, Europe in the long term is a loser. They will have to spend more on defense. They will have a, a war-like scenario, a, a little Cold War building up again. So there are issues uh, that uh, Ukraine will have to, uh, you know, face. The Russians are going to be a loser because they are already a declining power. The economy will be affected, uh, we, we like it or not, in the long term. Uh, and of course, uh, winner has come out very clearly. Q and A also is the military industrial complex of USA uh, because uh, with more members in NATO, with defense budgets going up in Europe, uh, surely they're going to have more sales, but some of the uh, speakers, uh, people that we met here in CAPS uh, are talking already that could there be a LOC type of arrangement uh, to cease fire for the time being and then get on the uh, table, but whether, uh, you know, what will be the guarantees, what will be, whether Crimea will ever be, you know, uh, negotiated are questions which uh, time only will tell. Uh, as far as the uh, CCP uh, 20th uh, Congress is concerned, uh, of course, con consolidation of these uh, position, yes men in position, no successor, uh, that means yet another uh, possible term. Of course, ISDG capsule perhaps uh, never interact with the Philip Piro or the CMC, but I was very concerned that there's no female uh, in either of these two organizations. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, as far as uh, promotions are concerned, I found that uh, uh, it's coming out that LAC, people who have uh, India-centric generals or Taiwan-centric generals with experience are getting promotions. So that is uh, a thing that uh, yeah, technology uh, importance has come out even in the Q&A session. And uh, China's economy is slowing down, but it's significant. So not slowing down enough. So therefore, uh, there is going to be action there. And uh, as far as America is concerned, my personal opinion is, I think they're getting fatigued of wars, at least the public. And therefore, they do not want to get into wars in Ukraine, of course. Uh, they are going to pump in some more money. But even there, the questions are being asked. So there is a, uh, you know, uh, a concern on that. Beijing is going to be continue to follow a muscular approach. You know, uh, China's rise is not going to be peaceful. I, I feel that uh, they will continue uh, to, uh, you know, uh, arm twist or uh, inflict both India, Taiwan, Japan, uh, as has also come out very, very clearly. The centrality of ASEAN has been spoken of again and again, recent, uh, uh, you know, uh, summit in Cambodia they talked about. So I think ASEAN is uh, going to remain central, but if when you go and meet the ASEAN representatives, you find uh, that they are very scared of China. Uh, they feel that they need Chinese money, but they do, don't want them to arm twist them. And we all know that in South China Sea, which the Vietnamese call it the East uh, uh, Vietnam Sea, uh, the, the, the large number of countries have lost, uh, you know, area. And I personally feel that the world's response to uh, this uh, 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 Chinese belligerence uh, has been rather soft. Uh, China's uh, rapid militarization, the incidents that we have had uh, uh, have been spoken of uh, by the speakers. And, uh, but I find that uh, many people uh, um, in the Indian strategy community and in the media continue to feel, be a little pessimist about India. And my personal feeling is uh, that uh, I think they're not badly off. You know, if you read the Taiwan incident, uh, Taman incident in detail, uh, we have not, uh, we, we were all right. We were in a position of strength. We are sitting on the high ground. We had the warning and people moved in, moved in well in time. So I think we have been uh, quite all right. And our Indian Army, Indian Air Force, very, very well positioned uh, as far as uh, uh, the, uh, you know, Chinese are concerned, as far as the Indian Ocean are concerned. Yes, muddy waters, they are coming, but their presence. Uh, uh, Djibouti, yes. But eight countries are sitting in Djibouti, eight countries, including US, France, you know, a whole heap of the countries are sitting there. Other presence, Hanbun Kota, Godan, yes. They, they are there, 
but I, I think their physical presence. Has an aircraft carrier ever sailed to uh, Indian Ocean? No, will not sail for another five years, perhaps, Chinese aircraft carrier. So, yes, uh, some spy ships coming here, monitoring our missile launches, some of these things are happening. Uh, so, overall, I am personally, uh, you know, uh, quite uh, optimistic about uh, what the state of affairs are. Uh, it uh, remains for me to just uh, first to thank the audience, large number still there. I hope that's also because of the love. And uh, let me uh, put, let's all put our hands together for the audience first, yes. <laughs> and uh, 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 I want to uh, thank the uh, chair, the, uh, you know, panelists for very interesting uh, uh, debate and the audience for the lovely questions. I also want to convey my appreciation for ADG Caps uh, and his team for uh, organizing this uh, uh, event uh, very, very successfully. And uh, with this, these few words of thanks, I want to request each one of you to kindly join us for lunch. Yeah.